Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world. This is Martin Hubel, your host of the Diva Tonight Show. And uh, this is the start of our 13th season doing this show. This is episode number 237 of the DB2LUW edition. I've got a very, very special guest with me today. I've got Tanmay Bakshi of the IBM Toronto Lab, who's here to talk to us about uh, DB2 REST and give us a good example from movie recommendations to Shazam. So how are you today, Tanmay? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm really excited to be on the, the DB2 Night Show. Well, this is, uh, we call it the night show, even though we record it during the day, because people can listen to it wherever they are, whenever they want, once they, they hit a replay. So let me go through the uh, our housekeeping, and we'll turn things over to you. And uh, let's see, we've got uh, got some people on, which is absolutely great. Let me, uh, uh, as always, here's our social media page. We now have uh, Twitter. We've got the LinkedIn uh, group. Don't see much activity in that, but the uh, Twitter account has an awful lot of followers, and we're grateful for those. And it's great for a way for us to get news out about the show. And our replays are on YouTube, and you can follow our our uh, YouTube channel. You'll find the links or the uh, replay itself on our uh, the replay blog for the DB2 Night Show. And here's our standard disclaimer. Uh, uh, we respect copyrights. Uh, we're recording and all of that sort of thing. I didn't put my phone in the other room. I apologize for that. That was meant, that's something I always do, except today I forgot. So um, carrying on with our, uh, our, uh, our quick announcements and stuff like that, our next show, uh, I've got a feeler or two out to the IBM Toronto Lab, and I'm hoping to have a particular individual on to give us an update. Um, the date is October the 15th. Uh, our next show is next week. Dave Belke will be talking about uh, uh, security by design, which is uh, uh, really a good thing. And we'll also, I've again got a feeler out for the next speaker on the 22nd of August, and that'll be our next DB2 night show for the uh, Z or ZOS platform. And then we'll we'll have dates, of course, in November, uh, December. I'll get on those. I'm busy this week updating a DB2 LUW performance class I've got to teach uh, in the near future, so I'm going to get on to finding speakers as soon as I turn those materials over to uh, Themis so I can get back to uh, doing other things. And as always, uh, I'm interested in receiving suggestions for speakers and topics, and we'll see what we can do in, in lining those people up if there's something you'd like to know. We're still in a virtual world, and it looks like we'll be here for some time. For example, I dug uh, in uh, Europe will be now virtual in December. So we continue to have uh, go through a uh, virtual model and that's what, that's the uh, nature of what COVID is like. Uh, as always, our primary uh, found, uh, founding uh, sponsor of the DB, DB2 Night Show is DBI Software and you can watch their uh, demo, uh, which is off their website and they'll be more than happy to talk to you about how you can make DB2 go faster. Also, um, our winner uh, from our last show in June was Scott Tinsley of UPS, and he got an Amazon gift certificate, and it pays to watch the DB2 Night Show. Now, um, we're into a, a, a sad and special segment we did. Uh, the original uh, person that made the DB2 Night Show a reality was Scott Hayes, and um, I went through an awful lot of uh, uh, sadness and uh, a bit of shock when I heard that Scott had passed. He, he died of COVID. And uh, one of the shots that best shows uh, what Scott was to the community is he, he did go around the world. Uh, and he's got Mike Krafik, who's a, a past speaker on the DB2 Night Show. And here they are at the top of the Sydney Harbor Bridge. There's a, a bridge climb you, you can do. And there's Scott. Looks like uh, Mike is very happy that he's at the top and relieved and he's, uh, as uh, Scott probably talked him into doing this, they've got their hats and, and the, the garb you must wear when you're on the bridge climb. And uh, a number of, uh, I know an awful lot of people have great stories they could tell. Uh, I also invited uh, other people to come and to perhaps say a word or two about Scott. Uh, I noticed that Ember's online 
Um, and uh, looks like she's paying attention now. And uh, I'm going to unmute you, Amber, if you're interested in speaking. Saying, uh, I know you're also self muted as well. If you, if you feel like saying anything or. Hey, Martin, can you hear me? I can. Great. Uh, yeah, I just I, I want to say that, you know, Scott was, uh, I think, to many members of the DB2 community, a mentor um, that he offered help in our careers. He offered help with specific technical problems um, and he did all that without asking for things in return. Yes, he was selling a product, but he wasn't trying to sell the product in exchange for the help. He would help people whether um, whether it could converted directly to sales or not. Um, and I think that shows in the DB2 Night Show, and I think the whole uh, DB2 community misses Scott and is is not as well off without Scott. Thanks, Ember. I think that pretty well sums it up for an awful lot of people. I think an awful lot of the stories that we, I have that uh, with Scott is helping people and also uh, doing that into the wee hours of the morning. I don't know how many... Uh, how many uh, beers we managed to kill over the years, just Scott and my, myself together. Uh, and I know that an awful lot of other people in the uh, remembrances on this web on the uh, funeral website uh, also mentioned specific events where, where that sort of thing went on. So it's all part of the fun and, and Scott was great at building the DB2 community. I put a couple of slides together that just basically lay out what he did uh, and um, he also was involved and even hosted many IDUG events uh, in the later years, actually with the IBM as a co-host of his parties. So that was also, uh, we, we always had a bit of fun and he was interested in, in helping the community and making things interesting. Uh, the last slide I'll put up uh, is this one where uh, this show uh, received uh, uh, various awards from the uh, IBM community and uh, Scott himself became uh, an IBM champion or lifetime champion the year before I did. And we we were gold consultants together for uh, over 20 years together. So he uh, was quite the guy and uh, we'll miss him dearly. And uh, the show will continue in, uh, in, uh, to continue to share his vision of, of what the DB2 Night Show was to the community. And we thank him for starting it and we thank you all for uh, being members of, of the DB2 community and supporting the show by by your attendance. So with that in mind, um, our sponsors were basically DBI and yours truly, Martin Hubel Consulting. And uh, the next thing we need to do after that is to do our standard polling questions. And we've got a few of them that are interesting today. Uh, if you read the bio on, uh, on Tanmay, some of these questions are inspired by, by his abilities and and uh, his history. Uh, this is the standard question we always do to know uh, uh, which version of DB2 are you currently uh, running? And we're seeing those answers come in. I normally leave a poll open for about 30 seconds or so to give people a, a good chance to vote. And uh, 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 we've got a, uh, like a few more people to vote before we close this one off, but we're getting responses there. And uh, with that in mind, uh, I'll close the pool, poll in three, two, one seconds and share that result. And we've got people, uh, uh, about half the audience is on 11.53 uh, or higher. 11.56 is just announced and they're, they're uh, talking about the features that are gonna be in it. So that's uh, people up to 11.55 currently. All right, we'll hide that and move on to the next. These are the uh, questions that I, I uh, re refer uh, to with Tanmay. Tanmay's a, a little younger than most of our audience and uh, just really interested to know where you started first getting exposure to uh, computer science and that sort of thing. Whether you learned it at home or uh, some people actually um, uh, know that when they joined the uh, joined the service, they actually started uh, uh, programming. And I knew a guy that was uh, in the Vietnam War and he made, mainly was in Sia uh, Saigon doing doing IT. So that's the, the nature of the question. For me, it was in high school. I, I took uh, computer sciences the second year it was ever offered in the Toronto school system. But uh, here's what we have here. Uh, 
Um, and actually, I know people that uh, were given a programming test back in the day, and they were actually, if they had the aptitude, they were uh, trained in, in computer programming. Of course, that would be back in the 60s and 70s. So what we're seeing here is that um, people got started in high school, some people got started at home, and some in university. Interesting. Another question of the same, uh, along the same vein, got a couple of these here. How old were you when you first started programming? And uh, people seem to get into it the same age as me. I, I started programming at the ripe old age of 15 uh, on an IBM mainframe, because that's what we had at high school was uh, an IBM mainframe shared by all of the high schools in, in the city of Toronto. And that's interesting to see. People are getting the idea. People voted quickly on that. I'll close that off and, and share that with you. What we're seeing is that people learned either as mainly as teenagers or young adults. Interesting. And uh, the last question of this type, what decade did you first learn to program? Uh, this is not really tied to age here. I just, uh, when, when people started programming, I'm a, uh, and there are some older people like myself, uh, 1970s or earlier is when I did it. I put an emphasis on earlier for myself because I'm an old fart. And uh, got most people voting there. And just to show the experience of our audience, uh, mainly um, uh, mainly in, in the uh, 1980s or, or, or 70s, and I guess the uh, 70s and 90s uh, are a tie there. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that, folks. Uh, we've got some uh, questions now related to the topic. Is your company using REST? And uh, getting responses in on this. And uh, so far, we've got a, a smaller vote on this, but it's coming along. Give people a, another uh, five or ten seconds to cast their, uh, uh, give their opinion on this. I was going to say cast a ballot, but uh, that's not me. That happens on Monday in this country. We're having another election up here. But uh, here is the uh, result. It's, uh, about two-thirds of companies are using REST, uh, one, uh, and 20% uh, are not. And uh, planning to use or not sure is the uh, it fills out the percentage there. Close that off. And the last question we have before Tanme takes over is: Have you used Shazam? And uh, I'm expecting that the votes here will be uh, uh, well. I, give people a chance to see what it is and uh, get a feel for our audience here in terms of what the and interesting a lot of people have voted on this question uh higher percentage and the answer there is um about a about 33 33 percent or you know just uh over or under 33 percent that's kind of interesting to know as well even it's a pretty even split it is yeah Okay, well, that gives us an idea. We'll hide that. And uh, now we're back to uh, uh, me. And uh, and we'll put uh, turn things over to you, Tanmay. Uh, I will give you permission or uh, control. Uh, you can now share your screen. I'll make you the presenter. You should have that little message on your, on your screen. And as soon as you share, share it, we'll see it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I see I've been made the presenter. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Um, give me one moment to share my screen, everybody. Let's see, where's my main screen? There it is. You know, should be able to see my screen and you should be able to see me as well. Wonderful. Yes, I can uh, see you. That's fantastic. And uh, I'll be muting myself so that I don't make any undue noises to distract people, but I'll be watching the monitoring. Uh, uh, I'll be monitoring the question uh, queue, which is uh, by done by text, and I'll break in where need be and, and interact with you as need be as well. Makes sense, absolutely. I mean, first of all, to, to begin, I mean, again, 
uh, as Martin mentioned, any questions that you might have, you know, as I'm as I'm going through what I have uh, to show today, you know, feel free to put that in the questions in the uh, in, in the go to webinar, and I'd love to love to go ahead and answer them. Um, and I mean, to start off, I mean, first of all, again, a huge thank you to to, to, to Martin for for bringing me on the show um, and inviting me to be a part. Um, I mean, the DBT Night Show is really exciting. Um, I feel like it's a it's a great way to to connect with the community. That's always been something I've uh, I've been incredibly passionate about. I remember when I first uh, spoke to Martin, like a around a week or so ago um and i found out he was a uh, he was a lifetime ibm champion that was definitely really inspiring and, and sort of hearing his stories of you know coding for for, for so many decades is, it was was really fascinating um and i remember back when i was uh i think this was back when i was 12. um i i, I was the first ibm champion for cloud and i was also sort of called like the youngest ibm champion at the time um and so you know who knows maybe in a maybe in a, maybe maybe in some time um, I can, I can, I can, I can get that title too. So that's, that's definitely something that's, that's inspiring, but, um, you know, sort of diving right into uh, diving right into what I have to what I have to share today. Um, there are a couple really exciting applications that I've worked on that leverage the power of DB2 and, and particularly DB2 REST um, that I'd love to go ahead and share. That I think really you know show off what you can do uh, with the power of DB2 REST as sort of this communication um, protocol between your application and DB2, but also what you can just generally do with DB2 and with SQL um, that that you might not at first think you'd be able to do. <laughs> so I, I think we got some fun stuff going, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of coming up ahead of us. Um, to, to start off for a little bit of context, uh, I mean, as, as you know, of course, my name is Tanmay Bakshi, and, and, and really I've always been passionate about technology, um, you know, building technology, particularly in fields like AI and machine learning and working with data, um, and also creating resources for others to sort of be able to implement that technology themselves as well and sort of share what I know about that world of technology, um, which is why I have my YouTube channel channel called Tanmay Teaches, where I create tutorials on all kinds of topics from you know, programming and math to, to science and, uh, and, and so much more as well as the books that I've written um, in the world of technology. Uh, so far, four books, including you know, books on, on, on the Swift, Julia, and Go programming languages and how you can leverage IBM Watson to integrate AI capabilities into your applications. Um, now, to sort of dive right into uh, what I have to show you today, I think it would be great to start off with a demo of an application powered by DB2 and DB2 REST. Um, now, in particular, what I'm about to show you is a movie recommendation application um, that is powered uh, by a by a, a movie by a movie recommender um, using the Turi Create library. Now, before I sort of dive into how it works in the back end, let's just take a look at how you can use it. Um, now, if you've used Netflix or you know similar sort of uh, movie streaming service, you've likely seen their recommendations, um, and they can actually get pretty good. And the way that they're recommending movies to you is they are, of course, using machine learning algorithms in the back end to try and say, you know, based on the content that you enjoy and the particular even segments of content that you enjoy, uh, and based on, you know, your ratings, as well as other people's ratings, can we predict sort of uh, correlations between different pieces of content to see if we can predict if you would like a certain other movie or TV show. Um, and what you're seeing on screen right now is a deployment of a similar application um, that, uh, that allows you to basically find new movies that you like. Um, what you're seeing right now are a bunch of movies that I've already rated um, that I already enjoy. So, you know, maybe things like Endgame or the B movie or um, Shreks and 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 uh, the the Toy Story movies, um, and so if I were to go ahead and and say you know what are some other movies um, that this algorithm thinks I would like, all I got to do is click on Find Recommendations, and just like that, it gives me a bunch of recommendations. So uh, the first uh, the first sort of I think really key technical component to focus on here is that as we ask for recommendations data in order to run the recommendation actually isn't even leaving the database. Right? The machine learning algorithm here is powered by Turi Create, which is an Apple library built in Python. Uh, it enables me to build uh, movie recommendation systems, really recommendation systems in general, very easily. 
Um, and despite the fact that this is a custom Python library with a bunch of dependencies, you know, data is not leaving the database because it's implemented as a UDF within DB2. So what I can do is I can take these ratings from my user profile, upload them to a table on my, on my DB2 database, and just call this UDF and say, given this table, given this user's ratings, uh, can we get recommendations um, for, for, for them as to what to watch next? And just like that, I can click on find recommendations and take a look at movies that it thinks I would like. And I can, you know, go through here and, and take a look at uh, what it recommends for me to look at. And so that's sort of what, uh, what, what this application uh, enables you to do. Now, what's interesting is that all of the data behind this application is stored on DB2 as well. Um, so, for example, if I were to uh, search for different kinds of movies here, um, all of these movies are stored within DB2, including information like the production companies behind them and the genres that they belong to. I can modify my ratings, of course, um, and I can find new recommendations. Um, and here's what's really interesting. The way that this application works, of course, I'm storing all of this data in a sort of relational format in the back end, but there's also a capability that DB2 has called DB2 Graph, which you've probably heard of uh, more previously on the DB2 Night Show as well. And so I'm not gonna go into huge detail as to how DB2 Graph works, but effectively now with DB2 Graph, I have the capability to query this sort of relational database in a graph manner. So for example, uh, let's just say I scroll down to, um, let's just say uh, the Spider-Man 2 movie. All right, so Spider-Man 2 here. And if I were to click on explore similar movies, what that's gonna do is it's going to run a Tinkerpop Gremlin query um, on my relational database, right? So I'm doing a graph query on this relational database. And I'm asking it basically to tell me, you know, with this, uh, with, with this long Gremlin query, I'm basically asking it to tell me, give me other movies that share at least one genre and one production company um, with the Spider-Man 2 movie. Um, and if we give that a second, this takes a bit to load, um, then it's going to go ahead and show me this sort of network of, there we go, a, a bunch of different movies that sort of share um, those connections um, with, uh, with, with, with Spider-Man 2. Um, and, you know, from there I can, I can go ahead and, and, and sort of explore more about uh, the, the, the movies in this graph. Right, so for example, Jumanji, for example, you know, I, I know this movie, if I wanna understand a little bit more about the context as to, you know, who made this, I can traverse out its edges, I can take a look at its production companies, I can focus on the name for, for, for the companies and the genre. Um, if I wanna see how that connects to, um, say, another movie um, like The Adventures of Elmo and Grouchland, all right? Um, if I wanna traverse out its edges, I can see how that connects um, to Jumanji, and if it, if it does. Um, and, and there's so much more you can do, right? Like from a business perspective, being able to explore your data visually like this has all kinds of use cases. If I wanted to understand, for example, um, what kind of movies TriStar Pictures works on producing, you know, I can traverse in those edges and suddenly, give that a second, I can take a look at all these different movies um, that are produced by TriStar and I can start to take a look at different relationships, like for example, Matilda. You know, what, 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 it, can we understand what genres, for example, uh, TriStar uh, sort of works on producing movies for by, by taking a look at this graph? So all kinds of capabilities you have here um, powered by, by, by DB2 in the back end. Um, and all of it, of course, being super convenient to implement, I think is the key, um, while still having that sort of scalability and flexibility thanks to REST and Graph, which, is the two, which are the two capabilities that I'm really excited to be able to, to talk about today. Now, um, to begin, I want to dive a little bit deeper into sort of like the architecture behind how something like a DB2 REST actually works. And to start off, let's talk a little bit more about searching, right? So searching through movies, you might have seen, um, I've been able to, you know, search through uh, this sort of database of 60,000 movies. And the basic query that goes behind that uh, is effectively this, right? So a super simple standard SQL query uh, where we're looking for titles uh, in our movies uh, that contain Toy Story. Anywhere in the title just contains um, the, the character sequence Toy Story. And if we can find that, then we want to surface that as a result to the user. Um, now, in order to run this sort of SQL query, what's really nice about the architecture behind REST is you don't need to actually run the query from your application. Your app is completely agnostic to how that query is actually implemented or what it's doing. 
Rather, what your app is doing is it's calling an endpoint on the DB2 REST server that's responsible for taking a parameter, like for example, title, and responsible for returning to you the relevant rows that your application expects. And so what that means is internally, whatever that service is doing, how it decides to query DB2 is none of your application's concern. And this is how you would register one of these queries against DB2 REST. It's a super simple post request against DB2 REST, um, and it enables you to pass in a couple of key you know, pieces of information. Things like the query that we're running is, well, a query, and it's not a statement. We're not trying to insert data. We're trying to select data. Um, it tells us things like the parameters. So in this case, we only expect one parameter, a uh, string called title. Uh, allows us to give it information like the description, name of the service, uh, but primarily, the statement that we actually want to execute uh, the SQL statement, uh, which you can specify here, use parameters, uh, kind of like a stored procedure. And then once you've created the service by sending the simple post request, all you got to do is send a new post request to this brand new endpoint created by DB2 REST. You can pass it the parameters and you can get your results. In this case, we're just saying, you know, we're looking for, for, for movies containing Toy Story in the title. Um, and there is another really important parameter here to, to keep in mind sync true. So this is a synchronous query. I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. But when you run this query, you get back JSON basically describing exactly what your SQL query returns to you. And just like that, you've got your results. Right? That's, that's how convenient DB2 REST makes it to call into DB2 and run queries like that. Um, now, I, I did mention the sync true parameter, uh, but what would happen if you ran it with sync false? Well, you'd be running what's called an asynchronous query. Uh, so what you'd basically be doing is starting a new job. So instead of DB2 REST coming back to you right now with immediate JSON and the full result of your query, let's just say your query is large. Instead of getting back that result at once by doing a synchronous query, you can do an asynchronous query that will result in you getting uh, a job ID. And now you can sort of continually query DB2 REST against this job ID and keep asking for new results, new pages of results, um, instead of expecting the whole thing as one very large response. Um, and so once DB2 REST gives you um, this ID, you can go ahead and um, use this ID uh, send over a post request, uh, tell it, you know, say I only want one result per page, and you can keep sort of iterating and getting new results with every call that you make into the API, right? You can, you can continue to get more. Now, the architecture of DB2 REST and the way that it sort of works and you know, the sort of life cycle that it goes through makes it really convenient to tie into existing sort of programming language infrastructure and makes it super convenient to just sort of integrate into your applications. It's very natural the way that it works. And, you know, a perfect example of this is a Swift wrapper that I wrote for DB2 REST, for example, um, that enables you to quite simply create a new DB2 handler with certain authentication settings to connect to DB2 REST and the DB2 database behind it. Um, and you can quite literally simply run uh, asynchronous and synchronous jobs just like this and get query responses for generic structures, for example, like in Swift, uh, this movie structure. All I got to do is say run sync job, give it the service name, tell it what to expect as a response. And just like that, I can print out my array of movies. It's all type safe and it's all helped out uh, in terms of you know, keeping, keeping things safe by the Swift compiler. Um, as a matter of fact, the convenience doesn't even end there, right? If I wanted to do asynchronous tasks, um, I don't need to worry about things like making sure I stop my jobs on time and that I you know, don't keep things running longer than I need to because all I need to do is use this wrapper that I've built, uh, tell it that I want to run this job um, and tell it to keep getting new pages. And when the job goes out of scope, Swift simply calls its deinitializer and I can tell DB2 REST, hey, we're never going to be querying from this job again because it's gone out of scope. We can we can cancel this job now. And so, you know, the, the way that this is architected really lends itself to integrating very naturally into your applications. And once again, it makes it more agnostic of what's happening in the back end. So if tomorrow you say, there's a more efficient way to run this query, or, you know, we could be sending less data than we actually are currently. You have the flexibility um, to, to, to change that on your back end without requiring any front end changes. So uh, there, there's all kinds of possibilities that I think this, this, this opens up for, for, for developing applications. Um, and movie recommendation is just the beginning. Now, personally, I find this architecture really enjoyable. 
Uh, I, I personally had a great time working with this. I remember their applications that I built just a couple of months ago. Um, and back then, you know, this was, this was before I joined the DB2 team. I was using, you know, PostgreSQL and, and other sort of database software. And when I joined the team and I started using these capabilities, I, I, I wondered to myself, you know, how great would it have been if I already knew about this a little while ago? Um, and, you know, I, I could have saved so much time. And even though I, I you know, from, from an unbiased perspective, really do love um, the, the, the service, I can still see why you would think I'm biased a little bit. <laughs> um, and so I, I thought it would be really nice to get someone's unbiased perspective, uh, you know, for, from, from scratch, someone who's barely worked with this technology, um, to get their perspective on uh, on on this tech and 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 how uh, sort of enjoyable it is to work with and how intuitive it is um, the sort of architecture that goes behind it and so for a much more complex application than just movie recommendation I reached out to a friend of mine um, and asked uh, them if they'd be willing to learn a new programming language Go through my book Tammy Teaches Go as well as SQL and how to call into DB2 through DB2 REST uh, in that programming language uh, and see if they, you know, if, if the entire pipeline sort of made sense to them. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I reached out to my friend, um, her name's Simone Oatsvirk, um, and asked her to basically re-implement one of the applications I had already implemented in Swift in Go using these capabilities. Um, and you know, in, in, a couple, in a couple days, maybe a week or so from now, uh, we'll be doing a sort of dedicated live stream separately on my YouTube channel to talk more about the capabilities we've built out um, with, with Simone's code. Um, but you know, I, I, I have a feeling she, she enjoyed working with, with, with DB2 REST and writing that code. So I, I'm, happy, I'm happy to say um, that, it was, that, that it, was a, it was a good experience. <laughs> now, now diving right into this sort of more advanced application I was talking about, and this, this sort of goes back to the, the poll um, that we were running towards the beginning of the session, um, and, and this is sort of also where we start to have a bit more fun. Um, when's the last time that you were in, say, a mall, or you were, um, you know, listening to the radio, uh, uh, or or really anywhere else where you're listening to music, and you hear uh, you hear a song, but you're like. You know, even though I really like this song, I don't know what it's called, right? I don't know how I can find this when I go back home or when I want to add it to my playlist. That's incredibly annoying. <laughs> and in order to solve this problem, back in 2001, uh, Shazam Entertainment was founded. And Shazam's entire goal was, can we help people discover music through their phones, through recordings of music in the wild? And that is an incredibly challenging problem to solve, but they managed to do it. And today, Shazam uh, was acquired by Apple you know, a couple years ago. Uh, today, the application enables you to effectively pull out your phone practically anywhere, um, and it enables you to effectively record a couple of seconds of music in your environment, regardless of any kind of noise that might exist, um, and, and it enables you to practically instantly recognize what is playing in your environment from its catalog of millions of songs. It truly is an incredible capability. And the way that Shazam works internally, before I sort of show you a, a fun little demo I prepared, um, is there's sort of two stages to it. First of all, there's the ingestion stage, which is where um, Shazam's responsible for taking a bunch of reference audio. So this is millions of songs in Shazam's case. And it's running basically what they call an audio fingerprinting algorithm. So what that means is they're trying to extract unique fingerprints from all of these different um, songs, from all this different music. And once they've extracted these fingerprints, which are represented as hash values, they then store these hash values in a database somewhere. What's nice is that the way that the hash values work lend themselves nicely to being stored in a relational database. And we'll get into that in just a moment. And then when you're running a query, all you got to do is take you know, the user's phone, take the audio that they're recording from it, um, and then run that through your audio fingerprinting algorithm. Now you've got all of your millions of reference fingerprints uh, that you've already ingested, and you've also got the user's new query fingerprints, and you run a matching algorithm. You try and see if you can match up the fingerprints between the references and your, your user's query to see if there is some sort of correlation between one of those references and the query. 
and that's going to be your match. Um, and you can get down to the level of finding individual scores and, and calculating confidence values and, and all sorts of stuff. And so that's how, that's how Shazam works. What makes it really, really difficult, and, and, and the reason that this is such a novel algorithm, at least you know, it was when, when it was invented, um, is because there are three main challenges you really need to solve. First of all, you've got to make sure that it's fast. If you just have to wait a long time to figure out what the song is, it's not going to work. Um, and especially because we're dealing with millions of songs here. Right? You, we, we can't be manually trying to sync up the audio waveform for every single song. That's just not going to work. It's infeasible. Um, and similarly, it needs to be incredibly accurate, right? If users are getting a bunch of you know, false, uh, false results, it removes the value of using the application to begin with. And at the same time, it needs to be invariant to noise, right? If I'm in a, if I'm in a crowded mall, uh, I can't guarantee that I can get a clean recording of the original song. As a matter of fact, I can't guarantee it's gonna be clean from a hardware perspective, right? My phone might be very well tuned to pick up human speech, but it might, not, it might be sort of uh, cutting off certain frequencies of music. So how can we make sure that things like compression and noise don't affect the results that we get? And well, I'm glad to say that Shazam figured it out, um, and what I did is sort of re-implemented uh, the Shazam algorithm from scratch, looking at their paper um, in, in, in Swift, and I call this implementation Atomic. And uh, without any further ado, I think it would be pretty fun to take a look at a demo of Atomic in action, see if we can actually recognize some music live. Um, and then there is a, a fun little twist to the way that we run queries um, that I'll get to after I show you a demo as well. So uh, let, let's, let's start off here. I've got my iPad with me. Um, now you can't see uh, in my, my iPad screen, but if I stop sharing my slides for just a moment, you should be able to see me. Um, and you know, on my, on my iPad, I've got music. And what I can do is I can, on my iPad, go ahead and play a song. You should be able to hear it. And on my phone, I've also got an iOS application. And this iOS application, of course, I'll just call it Atomic. Uh, super simple. All it does is it connects to DB2 and it enables me to run queries against, um, uh, against this sort of database of reference hashes. So here's the idea. I've got this super simple iOS application. It's got a record button. Uh, it's going to, when I click on that record button, it's going to record about seven seconds worth of audio. And it's going to try and recognize what the song is um, that's playing in those seconds of audio. So let's go ahead and try it out. So I'm going to go ahead and play the song, hit record. So song's playing now. Recording. There we go, it's done recording. And as you can see, it's gone ahead and successfully predicted what was uh, playing through my iPad. Um, and that is an example of atomic in action. We can try that again just to, just to see what else it works with. Um, I can play, say, this song over here. Um, the current corpus contains about 250 songs. Um, and of course, this can scale to thousands, hundreds of thousands because of the scalability of the database in the back end, which again, I'll get to in just a moment. But once again, if I were to go ahead and run something and click on the port, Give that a moment. So we need to record again. And there we go. As you can see, it successfully predicts what the song was that was running. As a matter of fact, not only does it predict the song, but Shazam also implements their algorithm in a way and, and, and sort of I've implemented logic that enables us to figure out where exactly within the song the user was when they hit the record button. So in this case, it knows that I started recording at 11 seconds into the song. Now, the reason that that's so incredible is because now this opens up a whole world of other possibilities apart from just music discovery. Right now, if I wanted to, for example, implement an interactive advertising use case, and if I were, say, an IKEA, and if I had an application that could instantly recognize, uh, hey, someone's listening to an IKEA ad on their TV, then what I can do is I can start to pop up contextually relevant information uh, from that ad 
on my application saying, hey, we noticed you're at, you know, say 27 seconds in this ad and we're, you're looking at this chair. Pop that up on the application, the user instantly has access to what they're seeing. Right? These, these are all, there's all kinds of things that you can do um, when you have access uh, to information on what users are listening to in their environment. And that is how uh, Shazam and how my implementation of, of Atomic uh, using, using, using DB2 works. Now let's dig a little bit deeper into the sort of back end behind this. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, the sort of there, there, there are two critical components to this working. One of them is, of course, the audio fingerprinting piece. <clears throat> and then the second piece is matching fingerprints from queries to reference hashes. Now, I'm not going to go into extreme depth on how exactly the, uh, the whole audio fingerprinting algorithm works, but I will explain it briefly. Uh, basically, the way that it works is you start off by converting your audio files into a spectrogram. Now, uh, some of you may know what a spectrogram is and how it's generated. Um, in case you don't, basically the idea is um, that given an audio waveform, um, you run a sliding window across that audio waveform. Um, and for each sort of window of data that you extract from that, from that waveform, you run a fast Fourier transform, uh, you figure out the frequencies um, that, that sort of compose that specific window, and then you assign um, that, that sort of result of frequency um, intensities uh, to a column of the spectrogram. So every column in the spectrogram that you see on screen right now, for example, represents the frequencies um, for a specific window. Um, and you know, as we move from the left to the right, uh, of, of course, that's the, the sort of corresponding or, or or the subsequent window uh, from the last one. And so on the x-axis, you've got your window. On the y-axis, you've got your frequency. And the color that you're seeing over here, uh, the, the brighter the color, the more intense the frequency uh, within that sliding, within that window. And so effectively, this lets us take a look at the evolution of frequencies within a certain piece of audio over time. And there's all kinds of hyperparameters you can, you can sort of choose, things like how, how much your window strides um, and how, how large the window is. Um, however, I use some you know, pretty standard defaults, uh, like a 40, uh, 4096 window size and a 2048 stride um, for a sampling rate of 48 kilohertz. So given the spectrogram, the way that Shazam processes it, and the way that I've implemented it uh, in, in, in Atomic, is basically uh, to do this thing called constellation map generation. And the way that constellation map generation works is it's basically a fancier word for peak detection, right? So, so local uh, peak detection, local maximum detection. Um, and effectively what we're doing is we're basically looking for all the bright spots uh, within this spectrogram. And so, you know, X marks the spot here. Um, basically, all the all the little all the little X's you see on the on the spectrogram, uh, those are the bright spots that the constellation map um, generation algorithm found. And the reason that it's called a constellation map by the paper is because, you know, if you, if you look closely, it kind of looks like um, a bunch of stars in a constellation. So <laughs> that's that's why they call it that. And in order to make use of these stars and to sort of um, make it make it make it make it useful, um, they have to somehow sort of digest the information from from the stars. And in order to do so, basically what they do um, is they need to make them time invariant. What does that mean? Well, the idea is that if you were to have someone, you know, playing uh, playing a song, and if you were to record that song, and if you were to extract these stars, and if you were to have your reference stars, in theory, if you were to have sort of like two, you know, transparent pieces of paper with those stars marked out, and if you were to slide the user's query over the reference, the idea is that if the two songs are a match, you would see a lot of the stars line up at one point, right? And at that point, where they line up, you confirm that it's a match because a lot of them match up. And you also know sort of where the user started recording in the song based on the offset of those sort of transparent pieces of, um, you know, those two transparent sheets um, from each other. And the, the sort of question now is, how do you implement that logic computationally? Because 
checking every song manually like that is incredibly compute intensive. So once again, the way that they do it is by creating time invariant hashes. And these are implemented by basically um, taking every single individual star um, within this constellation map and choosing a bunch of other stars in front of it. And for every pair of stars that we generate, we go ahead and instead of storing the star locations, rather we store the frequencies of both stars and the offset, the, the delta in their timing. Right? We don't store when star A and when star B, you know, where, where we're seen in the, in, in the audio. Rather, we store the difference in their timing. And if you think about it, that's a really smart way of doing it. Uh, and, and the reason it's so smart is because, well, it doesn't matter if, you know, I'm recording a song from 10 seconds in um, or if it's the original reference that started at the very beginning. If there is, you know, uh, if, if, there, if there are going to be two stars at 30 seconds that I end up recording in both anyway, well, if I don't care about the absolute timing for them and only their relative timings, that hash, that fingerprint is going to show up in both, right? And so it's a really smart way of storing time invariant, very much digested information of what an audio file sounds like, sort of unique, again, fingerprints. Um, of what make up that audio file. Um, Shazam in particular uh, sort of implements this in, in also a really smart way where the hash only consists of frequency, frequency, delta in terms of time, but they also store alongside it all of the timestamps, all the different sort of windows where that first star in the pair occur. Right? This might not be immediately intuitive at first, but the reason that it's nice to also store that information is because now when you're running queries, if you see a bunch of star matches that occur at the same relative offsets from query to reference, then you can be even more sure that the user is indeed, for example, recording a certain song, because now you know that the offsets line up pretty much perfectly. So not only do you know that there are lots of like relative similarities, but also you sort of done the metaphorical sliding the transparent sheets on top of each other and seeing that they line up at a certain point and figuring out what that point is. Uh, now the way that Atomic in particular works um, is sort of this flow. The user, of course, is using the iOS front end uh, that I just demonstrated, um, and it uses a, a custom Swift implementation of the entire Atomic logic. Uh, this is something that I wrote, and it uses all kinds of really, really neat features like uh, metal acceleration for uh, constellation map generation. And uh, there's also a Go implementation of the Atomic source code. Um, this is uh, the code from Simone, uh, as I mentioned, um, implementing uh, a DB2 REST wrapper, implementing the audio fingerprinting, um, and implementing the data loading um, all in Go. The sort of flow for this application is that at first you start off with a corpus of songs uh, fed into the Go version of the Atomic application, which extracts fingerprints and uploads them to DB2, storing you know the files that we've um, the files that we've loaded in a file list and the reference hashes as well. And then we have the Swift version that's sort of doing fingerprinting on the fly from short recordings and then uploading that to DB2 to run a query to try and run fingerprint matching. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but that was, in my opinion, the most incredible part of this application. This is the part that I'm most excited about, personally, is this is a re-implementation of Shazam with the core fingerprint matching logic implemented in SQL. Um, and at first, this sort of just started as a, hey, it would be neat if I could do this in SQL instead of doing it in Swift thing. But then eventually I realized, huh, this is actually a viable way of doing it. This is actually a genuinely good scalable way of implementing Shazam in SQL or implementing or really implementing this algorithm in general. Uh, now the actual query um, that, that sort of implements this logic does look a little bit intimidating. Um, it's it's kind of long, um, but you know I, I'd love to go ahead and break it down a little bit to sort of um, sort of show you what's what's going on behind the scenes here um, to implement uh, implement fingerprint matching. Uh, of course, in the back end, uh, we start off uh, really, I think, you know, the, the, this, this query actually should be split up into two components. And so I'm going to start off by describing one component, then we'll describe the next. Um, and this first component starts off by selecting um, files and hashes 
from the actual reference hash table. Um, and what this is doing is it's basically giving me all of the unique hashes from every file um, that exists in, in reference hashes because there might be duplicates of hashes because they might occur at different sort of um, uh, timestamps. So we go ahead and deduplicate them, we get all the unique hashes, um, and at the same time, we get also all the relevant query hashes. So the way the query hash table works is we're storing hashes in their times, of course, but we're also storing them against a query ID so that if two users are using the application at once, for example, their queries have separate query IDs so that we can keep their hashes separate. So we go ahead and figure out the relevant query hashes, and then we sort of combine that information. We join uh, the reference uh, hashes as well as the query hashes on a match between um, the reference hash and query hash. Um, and then after that, we've basically got uh, a table, uh, sort of like an intermediary table, where every row represents a file ID, and then you've got two columns with the exact same value representing a hash that matches between the reference and uh, the, the, the query. And once again, because we know the file IDs for every single correspondence, we can then go ahead and do things like count um, how many uh, matches there are per file. So once again, this is the sort of join that lets us figure out the matches. And now to count how many matches there are per file, we can run a query like this one. Um, and now suddenly we're able to figure out how many unique hash matches there are between uh, references and queries. And so this is, our, this is our final sort of part A to the larger query. And it helps us once again answer that question of how many hashes match between the query and each reference recording, right? We're gonna call this intermediary match count. Now we get to answer a different question. And that's the question of offsets. Where in the audio um, do these segments take place? Uh, and in order to answer that question, of course, we start off with selecting, once again, the relevant query hashes. Um, and then we start sort of building it up into a larger, uh, lar larger query. So what we do is we, we, we join these, these query hashes with reference hashes, and we calculate for every matching sort of overlap uh, between a query hash and a reference hash for every single possible timestamp of each. Um, so locally within each you know, hash, effectively n squared. Um, we then take a look at the relative differences in their starting timestamps. Um, of course, we're looking at the absolute values of the differences here. And what this basically lets us do is create this new table of for every file ID um, and for every match of hashes that we saw, what is the difference in the starting times for those matching hashes. And then what we can do is we can count how many times um, each difference value occurs for each file. So for example, in this case, we can see that for file 130, um, the difference of 140 it, it, between certain hashes only occurs once. And then, once again, what we can do is we can, we can, we can choose the maximum, um, the, the, the sort of maximum occurring difference value for every file. And so just like that, we can go ahead and say, you know, given all of these different files and a bunch of different difference values, um, and also how many times each difference occurs, let's choose the top difference value for each file. And that gives us part B of the large query. So that answers the question of, you know, what's the most consistent time difference between matching hashes in the query um, and each reference recording, and how consistent is that time difference? So we get diff and we get diff count. And then given part A and B of that large query, you can sort of merge it into this even larger query um, that gives us all the information we need in order to surface relevant results uh, to the user in, say, a front end or an application. And that is how you implement Shazam fingerprinting and an audio matching um, in SQL something that I'm personally really excited about and that I think would be incredible to take a look at in just a little bit more detail before we uh, dive into answering questions. I mean, again, I don't see any questions yet in, in, in the GoToWebinar, but once again, if you have any questions, feel free to, feel free to start putting them in there and, and, and we'll get to them now. 
But just really briefly, I'd love to show you um, that, for example, um, what's going on in the back end here um, is I am using DB2 Warehouse on cloud. And what that means is the tasks that I'm running are inherently scalable, right? If I wanted to, um, for example, go to DB2 Warehouse um, and you know create a new instance right now, I could very easily, within an hour or so, create a new Flex instance and scale up to 160 compute cores. And I could probably deal with you know thousands of songs right off the bat literally just clicking the create button on IBM cloud. Um, unfortunately though, it does take a little bit of time to provision and I don't want to have to uh, have you all sit here for, for an hour and, and, and watch, a, watch an instance provision. So I've already provisioned the service for you um, for an atomic demo. And uh, you know, working with DB2 Warehouse is super simple. All I gotta do is open up my console and I've already got a little bit of SQL here um, sort of waiting for us to run. Uh, starting from complete scratch here, um, if I wanted to implement the sort of Shazam app that I've implemented, uh, all you got to do is start off by creating your tables. So creating your file list, your reference hash, your query hash tables. Again, we're just storing super simple data types, basically just integers. Um, and then you can go ahead and ingest your data. Uh, speaking of which, I can actually do that by running the atomic script here, um, which will go ahead and uh, ingest four songs that I've chosen um, into this database. As you can see, I just created these tables. Um, and after, after just a moment, uh, once I ingest these four songs into uh, the database, then I should be able to go ahead and run a query to see how many hashes exist per file. And then I should also be able to run, you know, custom queries against the iOS application against this brand new database. Um, so there we go. We're done ingesting. And if I were to run this custom little query here, we can see all the different songs, um, you know, Claudia Heuser's A Summertime Song, um, Maggie Lindemann's What I, um, we can see their file IDs and we can see the number of hashes inserted into the database um, through, um, uh, through, through the atomic script. Um, and this is, of course, using the Go implementation of the source code um, using some very interesting DB2 REST logic in order to upload, for example, uh, fingerprints for the reference files, like so. Uh, batching them into chunks 20,000, running insert into uh, statements against the database uh, through DB2 REST. Um, and so I, I do know we're sort of nearing the, the, the end of our scheduled time here, um, but you know, I, could, I could keep going and I could keep going into more detail as to how this works and how the DB2 REST wrapper works and, and, and so much more. Um, but I'd love to go ahead and see if there are any more questions now, really, really urge you to send in some more questions. Uh, yeah, Martin, if you- Indeed, you know. there are questions for, uh, related to your topic now. Um, comment from uh, Chuck was basically, this query looks like a good candidate for a common table expression. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I uh, am not a domain expert in SQL. I'll say that much for sure. As a matter of fact, I, um, I remember SQL was one of the first things I had worked with back when I was like seven and I touched upon it, then moved into sort of programming with other languages and hadn't touched it a lot since then. Um, so so this, is, this is something, you know, if, if you have any feedback on how to make this query better, I would absolutely yeah. love that. Yeah. Uh, any kind of optimizations would be great, but um, yeah, this is going to be an open source project too soon. So any contributions would be very much welcome. Well, wonderful. Um, Ember was asking if you have an online uh, tutorial available for this or another similar, similar project. Thank you for asking. Well, uh, yes, I do. They're coming out soon. Um, so once again, the entire goal um, behind this application um, and, and sort of behind me building this um, is to effectively provide resources for developers to you know, apply, apply this technology themselves. So this will be available as code patterns on IBM's GitHub page. Um, enabling you to quickly deploy them and get them up and running yourself, um, as well as a tutorial that I'll be releasing for both the Movie Recommender and the uh, Atomic application uh, later this month, early next month. Um, and so stay tuned for that. Definitely it'll be on, on my YouTube channel and on the IBM GitHub uh, repo. So uh, stay tuned. It's coming out soon. But yes, yeah. there will be educational content for it. Super. And uh, Rohit had a question. Uh... I know this program is in SQL right now. Would it be built in another language or is it going to work best in SQL for users? That's a great question. And I think it depends on the use case. Mm -hmm. there, are some, there are some specific use cases where having computation run on device can be helpful. Um, so, you know, Apple, for example, has this thing called Shazam Kit, which enables you to do a lot of the sort of 
raw querying logic on device, which can be helpful in some specific circumstances, like when you know a user won't have connection to the internet, or when you know you have a very small corpus so you can just store it locally. Um, in those cases, running things on device is fine. What's nice about being able to implement this in SQL, though, is that you get a lot of the inherent scalability nature of DB2, and you get a lot of performance for free, right? Like this SQL, without any particular tuning, this was practically just me logically thinking of all these components and sort of building up a larger and larger query. Um, without any particular tuning and with me being relatively new to SQL, I could put together a pretty fast query, right? DB2 Warehouse right now is running this, you know, about two seconds uh, and it can query through like 23 million hashes um, uh, with like 10,000 queries. Um, and, and, and so we get a lot of that performance for free without needing to spend a lot of time per actually, you know, doing performance tuning in code. Um, and so SQL is a nice fit here. Um, however, it does depend on the use case. So I'd say depends on what you're trying to do, but, but, but I, I, I do think SQL is a good fit for, for this specific application. Good. Sorry. Um, I know my keyboard is probably getting into the audio there, uh, but I had a question I was going to answer privately rather than uh, taking a, a show. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have you compare DB2 and Oracle for this application because this is an, a DB2 show. That's it. So uh, for better, or for worse, we are, uh, we're a DB2 show and we love it, DB2. We, and Oracle, um, they need to be somewhere else. <laughs> Now, another question here on how matching, uh, this is a hard question to interpret. Uh, uh, can we, uh, could we get isolated sound out of what you're doing as well with your, are, are you interested or is, is there any way to do that to get down to what the uh, author of the question is asking is uh, to get down to a pure tone. To get down to a pure tone. So yeah. If I get what you're asking, it would sort of be like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, feel free to send a follow up. But what you'd be asking for is basically, can we implement um, like almost voice isolation, sort of like in, in, in the latest iOS, sort of like noise cancellation almost. Um, <clears throat> the way that Shazam works and the way that, you know, I've implemented Atomic um, is it very, very much tries to lose a lot of data from the audio, right? Audio is super, super data dense. You know, you're capturing say 48,000 samples a second in two minutes of audio, that's a lot of data. <laughs> and so what the, the entire point of this algorithm is, is to go from millions of data points to maybe just a couple hundred or a couple thousand um, data points. And then from there sort of extract fingerprints from those data points. So unfortunately there's no way to go back from, you know, after going to, um, to fingerprints uh, back to audio, there's no way to implement that 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 conversion um, because you're losing way too much information in 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 in, in between there. Um, and so this is an algorithm that is very particularly fine tuned for audio recording matching, um, and really isn't great at, for example, isolation of of, of frequencies or, or things like that. Um, that's where you start getting into more machine learning based approaches, I think. Interesting. Great answer. Um, okay, I'm just looking here. I think that's the end of the queue for now. Do you want to, if they've got anything else to do or say or? Uh... Well, I mean, as I mentioned, um, uh, there, there's going to be a lot more to come. So make sure you're, you're all stay, you're, you're all tuned for that. Um, apart from apart from what I've shown you today, I mean, any other questions that you might have, you know, feel free to reach out to me on, on any of these social media or you know my email, and I'd love to love to get in touch or answer any of your questions or, or help you out with with implementing this. That's you know what I'm here for. Um, and so yeah, uh, stay tuned for the code pattern, stay tuned for the tutorial and the live stream that we'll be doing soon on implementing Atomic yourself and how exactly the back end works. Uh, so I, I'm definitely excited for it. Hopefully you are too. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to be able to meeting you all there. Perfect. Great presentation, lots of information. Uh, that people are gonna be thinking about this a lot and they're gonna be really interested in that tutorial when it becomes available. And uh, I you. encourage people to visit Tan May's website. It's certainly uh, accessible through IBM as well. Um, he's got a simple uh, email address at IBM. It's tanmay at ibm.com. I think that's the, that. <laughs> the only other one I came across that was simpler than that was a guy in the uh, in the Silicon Valley lab who was a drummer for a hobby, and his was drummer at, 
at us.ibm.com. I think it was back in the days when email addresses were brand new. That's absolutely a fantastic one as well. But um, that's super. Let me take back control, uh, wind up and ask our final question for today. So I will uh, grab control back from you. I, I hit, mm -hmm. the right, hit the right button this time. I'm hitting the wrong button. We'll do it the right, do this button. I'll take that. I'll show my screen. And uh, I'm still seeing your webcam here, but we'll close that off. And our final question for today is, as always, our show is sponsored by DBI, and they make great performance tools, and we encourage you to look into those. And we have our final question is, did you learn anything today? And uh, as expected, I'm uh, going to uh, share that now. Or, and we got most of the audience voting and most people learned a lot of stuff. That's absolutely great to see. And that's kind of what we expect on the DB2 night show and we have a great speaker such as yourself and uh, uh, we Thank you. often have that situation. And uh, with that, um, I'll cue the music and let people get on to their, uh, in the Eastern time zone here where there's food waiting. I will uh, start the music and uh, turn up the volume so maybe the people can hear it. There we go. And thank you once again, um, Tan May, for coming on the DVD Night Show and sharing your your vast knowledge uh, on this topic with people. I, I know everybody appreciated it. Uh, replay, replay will be available, and, uh, and uh, we'll see you next time on the DVD Night Show. Have a great weekend, and uh, all the best to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Be safe. Bye-bye.